Mm. Oh, I know. We'll do the show shot. <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to max out the show shot this game. Gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I am your host, the Talking Bollock. Today we are going over the show shop. Before we get to that, we of course have to thank the sponsor of this video, which is going to be... Gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying this fantastic show shop video with Forgotten Weapons, but before we go any further, I have to thank the sponsors of this video, which is going to be Americana Pipe Dream Apparel. Fantastic zoomers. Wow, what a fantastic zoomers they are. Some of the best. Some of the best. They excel at the Millsurp game. They are getting after it. They just moved into a new warehouse and they are just crushing the game when it comes to all the Millsurp stuff. They have awesome books. They have awesome knives. They're getting night vision. They are getting a bunch of cool stuff. So a big thank you to them. We also have to thank American Hartford Gold. Now, there's no question that we in the firearms industry, we like our precious metals, i.e. brass and lead, but there are some more such as gold and silver. And I do believe in giving you guys the knowledge of more financial options to diversify your portfolio. So a big thank you to American Hartford Gold. They have the resources to broaden your horizon. There is no question that the American dollar is being heavily contested in this day and age and the government is looking to go to a more digital route, so having precious metal diversification could be an important thing for you. American Hartford Gold has a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. Tell them I sent you and they'll give you up to $5,000 of free silver on your first order. So give them a call. Click the link in the description or call 866-516-7376 or text results to 65532. And head on over to them. I also want to thank the Sonoran Desert Institute. Get accredited gunsmith training. Get squared away. Don't let your SDI dreams be memes. They have some fantastic programs, one of which being a drone program. Very cool. Thank you, SDI. All right, now let's get back to Forgotten Weapons. Now, of course, this show shot is very cool. It's very sexy, it's very elegant, but it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to a man who doesn't actually forget any weapons despite his name. Mr. Ian McCollum, please get on over here, sir. Welcome back to the channel. Good to have you, sir. Sexy and elegant? Seriously, that thing? You know what? It's, uh, despite its steampunk ugly nature, it is to me rather pretty. Because as a gun guy, I like a lot of guns. It's pretty in, a, in like a, a low-key, pretty way. You know, if you date a girl where she, a lot of guys aren't going after, but she still has her cuteness to her, and she still has a great French round, so maybe that's what I mean. Okay. It's a reach. All right, let's go, let's go over this thing. Let's, let's, we're going to the truck bed. Gentlemen, so here's the deal. Here's a skinny. I am not an expert on the show, Sean, in any way, shape, or form. This is actually my first day shooting it. Ian was like, hey, will you come out and I'm going to torture you by shooting this gun? Which, of course, I have to say yes. It's good job security. And he was kind enough to let me borrow it for this video. So thankfully, I do have a quite literal weapons expert here to talk me through it. And I observe some things that I'm going to talk about, at least from my novice point of view that will relate better to you guys if you have never shot or handled the show shot. But if you have, then you know my pain, so. Don't sell yourself short. You now have more trigger time on one of these than 99.9% .9 of Right, everybody. right, right. You know, I'll take that. I'll take that and I'm happy with that. The problem is, is um, I was very blown away by the lack of, I would say, 
trueness to faith from the Battlefield franchise, because that's the only experience, I know it's nerdy, it's a video game, that's the only experience I have with this gun, but I was like, you know what, maybe I could base on it, because sometimes they are pretty good at, you know, taking the, the guns and translating them to video games, but not in this case, no, not in this case, no. The Shosha, like any sort of recoil control you have with a Shosha in a video game, it's all a lie, it's all fake news. Fake news. It's all propaganda. This thing, the recoil pattern sucks, but I'm going off on a tangent. Ian, please, can you just history lesson us on the Shosha? So the basic concept here is you get to 1915 in World War I, yeah. and you got trench warfare, and nobody really has light machine guns. Right. There have been a few that have been invented, the Madsons out there, some other stuff, the, mm. but the French army looks at the, the tactical situation and says, we need, a light, portable, infantry, automatic weapon that can be carried in the assault, drop into an enemy trench with a machine gun instead of a five-foot-long bolt-action rifle. And by the way, we need like a lot of them, so they need to be cheap, they need to be fast to manufacture. The design existed as the beginnings of actually an aircraft gun. Early versions actually had the magazine on top. Short notice, tweak up the design, give it a bipod, flip it around, set it up for infantry use, yep. and they end up producing more than a quarter million of these during World War II. Billions. Mm -hmm. This is the most mass-produced automatic weapon of the First World War. And billions. Now that's something that's very interesting because quantity has a quality all of its own. Exactly. If you, I mean, me already ragging on this thing, it's not a great LMG compared to all the LMGs I've shot, but it is still an LMG in the hands of guys fighting against guys that may not have as many LMGs like you were saying, like the Germans. It's 1915, do you right. want this or do you want a three round capacity bolt action? I'll take this. The thing about this is you don't have to fire it in full auto. Right. If you set the selector, and it has a selector, to semi-auto, you have a heavy and clunky, yeah. but a legitimate 18 round capacity semi-automatic mm -hmm. rifle in World War One, which is something that was not available really to anyone else. Right, and in a world of bolt actions, he who has a semi-auto may be exactly. maybe at least a king or a lord, I might say. So a lot of people will of course associate this with the French. It is, it mm. was the French standard weapon, eight millimeter Lebel, but this is also the standard weapon that was used by the American Expeditionary Force. Right. When we sent troops over to France, they took rifles, mm -hmm. but they got all their automatic weapons over in France. So they were using the Hotchkiss heavy 1914s and they were using the Shoshas as light machine guns. People think of the BAR as an American World War One right. gun. BAR shows up six weeks before the end of the war. That is very sad. Yeah. It, it gets there to be on paper, but yeah, I guess six weeks isn't four years of... Doesn't have a yeah. substantial impact on the outcome of the war in the way that this truly did. So immediately after World War I, the French recognized, and they knew this going in, but they couldn't do anything about it, that right. this cartridge is just bad. She kind of bad, though. It's mm. a terrible cartridge design. Mm. It's got a huge rim. It's got a huge taper. You have to have a Half Moon magazine to fit 18 rounds in it. Yeah. So they adopt a, a modern, rimless, pretty much straight-necked cartridge. And they'd make no attempt to convert this over to the new cartridge. They just start from scratch. The Belgians would use this into the 1930s. They did adapt it to 7.65 Mauser, which was their standard cartridge. And there was a version made for the Americans in 30-06. Very limited production, very limited use, but they are out there. The U.S. did not continue to use that after mm. World War One. Now, if you're wondering why I'm wearing frog skin camo and Ian's actually appropriately dressed, it's because I'm going off of the Battlefield Five lore. That is, they have the show shot in the game, and well, they have Pacific Marines in the game too. So I was like, well, my mental gymnastics work out in this, and I will take gold. Did this show shot actually show up in World War Two? Not really. There are some pictures out there of all things of SS troops with show shots. The SS always seemed to pick up some really weird guns and troops who are doing occupation duty in occupied France. That can make sense. They weren't giving them frontline guns. Those were no. desperately needed elsewhere. Mm. So they kind of picked up whatever they could get from local sources. You know, they used them for occupation duty. I'd be hard pressed to say any actually saw combat service. So the game yet again is not being totally historical accurate. Shocking. I mean, shocking a triple A shooter. This is my totally surprised face. Whoa. So what did you think of the sight picture on this? Sight picture is actually dog shit. It is terrible. My least favorite part about the sight picture and the V notch itself, the notches itself, I can work with that. I can handle that. The actual irons of the notch. The placement of the site is what is my biggest gripe. I wish they either would have moved it further back on the receiver because you have a lot of head space up here and I wish it was taller on the gun itself. I've got a surprise for you. What's that? This is the improved version. Oh my God. The Finns got these things as military aid in World War II. This is a Finnish one. You see how there's an extra sight notch here? Yeah. That's the original French one. The Finns added that and pushed the front sight over to match because it was just so hard to get a sight picture. Oh! So you're getting the product improved finish version of this. Oh! 
So this is what I mean by the, the sight picture. So when you 45 degree offset, I don't think I mentioned this in my video, but Ian in his video talked about a 45 degree offset when you're proned out and you get your cheek on the gun, you really have to get this really weird cheek placement for me to get a good sight picture. If I had it up here like this, I can't get a sight picture. My cheekbone is literally like nestled against the tube. He was saying you can't put your face on this bad boy right here because of the recoil. It's gonna give you, what was it called Ian? Le gif. Le gif. Chaya le bouffe. I know French too, buddy. That's a really, like, that's a really damned uh, sight picture if I've ever seen one. It just did not make for a comfortable shooting, especially with how the recoil is with that long recoil. It doesn't kick hard. No. It's not like it's excessively heavy recoil. No, it doesn't, but it doesn't hurt. The dynamic of it, the harmonics of the recoil on this, when it's kicking you and when it's moving forward is just terrible. Yes. Oh, man. The bipod's great though. It stands up wonderfully, right? <laughs> it does an excellent job being a bipod. No, it doesn't. That's fake news. Fake news. The surface level stuff, the ergonomics actually handling the gun, the pistol grip, very just, you know, get a look in wood. You got this the vertical grip, very forward thinking. I'll give them that, kind of. I wish it was further out so you could actually get a better grip. But I mean, for I guess what they're going for at the time. What they know at the time, the circumstances surrounding the situation. To be honestly, from the outside looking in, not that terrible, but from a modern perspective, perspective, absolutely terrible, right? I like to compare this to the Sten gun. You know what, that's an excellent example. I was thinking, I was like, this is French Sten yeah. on steroids. Super physiological levels. Yeah, we need a lot of light machine guns. Yeah. Quantity is more important than the quality of one specific gun, because yeah. these are gonna get destroyed by the bucket load in yeah. the trench fighting oh, of yeah. 19, 15, 16, 17. So we have to make them cheap enough that we can make a crap load of them. Yeah, it's not like, oh, these are high quality guns. You're gonna get bombed off the face of the earth before they ever get a shot yeah. through them. And every time I think of modern warfare, I always think of like humans getting together, like I will settle down and start farming. And then like a thousand years later, man-made horrors beyond our comprehension. The magazine themselves, you were saying a, uh, a design of, what would you call these? Garbage. A design of garbage. So it's intended to be disposable. Mm -hmm. It's made to be very thin, very cheap. Again, they're making millions. And billions. The two open slots are here for two reasons. First off, you kind of have to have, you have to be able to grab your your thumb on the follower here to load the thing. And secondly, this was originally envisioned as a two-man team gun. So you have a gunner, you have an assistant gunner. The assistant is the one reloading. So these open slots allow the assistant gunner to see when the magazine is empty or almost empty so that he can reload it for the gunner. If I was an American and I knew the BAR existed in World War I and I got off the boat, I am about to wreck so many tons with this thing. And then they're like, no, you're not. Here's a show shot. I would be pretty salty if I'm being that, honest. That pretty much did happen to the Marines. They got off the boat with Lewis guns and had to turn them in and get issued these instead. I have yet to get a Lewis gun on the channel, but I'm going to be excited to see how, what they were missing out on. Now you have a proper I have a baseline. I have a baseline. Guys, I am like historically bona fide now. All right, so the other thing I want to point out. Yes. You're wearing the walking fire belt. Thing. Yes, yeah, here we go. It has a metal cup, the butt stock, sits in, so you can hold that thing on the hip, and mm. the initial idea with these things is walking fire. You right. suppress the enemy trench while you march across no man's land. That worked as well as you'd think it works. Let me stress that you said this is an original, yeah, that's an original show shop belt, American not a BAR BAR BAR. belt. Correct. The BAR yeah. belts have BAR mag pouches. Okay, I wanted to stress that in case my audience missed that. They're probably looking at their phone, playing Subway Surfer. Now they gotta pay attention. By the end of the war, real tactics are starting to come out. Yeah. And the show shop becomes an integral part of combined arms attack. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you will have a, a squad of guys with a couple riflemen, a couple grenadiers, a guy whose real main weapon is a giant sack full of hand grenades, a couple Shosha gunners, a couple rifle grenadiers, mm -hmm. and you can essentially encircle an enemy strong point. Shosha gunners can suppress the position. Yeah. Rifle grenades can assist in suppressing the position yeah. while you have close combat guys infiltrate up close to the fortified point probably mm. a machine gun, maybe a pillbox, and then assaulted at close range with hand grenades and small arms while being suppressed from a distance by these guys. You put this into a team context like that, and it really was a very effective, very useful weapon. That sounds like a force multiplier. That sounds like yeah. modern tactics coming to fruition in, you know, 100 plus years ago. Exactly. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, the difference between the state of warfare in 1914 and yes. the state of warfare in 1918 Mm. was tremendous. And a lot of yeah. people don't really understand just how much changed during that. If you're ever looking for some good World War I history, just a, a very good digestible thing is probably Dan Carlin's oh. uh, Blueprint for Armageddon. Absolutely. Fantastic podcast. He has a great series on World War I. I highly recommend it. And it goes into like the progression from the beginning of 1914 to 1918. If you enjoy history at all, if you're an enjoyer like me and, and a, pretty much an expert like Ian, you're probably gonna enjoy it, so. Dan Carlin's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you were saying something about the aluminum shroud heating up after around what, two, 250 rounds? 250, maybe 300 rounds gotcha. of continuous fire. 
So no. mag dump after mag dump after mag dump. The way this thing's set up, you've got the barrel inside here and there's an aluminum shroud on the barrel or an aluminum radiator to pull heat off the barrel and mm -hmm. try and vent it out. That's why you've got the holes here. And then you've got a steel barrel shroud on the outside. Mm -hmm. And if you shoot it too much, that aluminum will heat up and actually expand faster than the steel here will expand. And at 250 or 300 rounds, the aluminum is, is now too big to actually slide freely inside the barrel shroud and the gun will simply cease to function. You'll, you'll get it like halfway into battery like this and it'll just yeah. stop. And the solution to that is you go put it in the shade mm -hmm. and you let it sit and cool down. And yep. as soon as that aluminum shroud contracts a little bit, It'll just do that. Good to go. And now it's good to go. Although good you go. go and dump a couple more mags and it'll immediately do the yeah. same thing. This was one of the primary problems with the Shosha. Although, mm. let's be honest, you put enough ammo through anything, you're gonna get heat related. Problems. Absolutely, absolutely. The other problem with it, of course, was the open-sided magazine. You know, if you're on a nice dry course of fire like we have here, yeah, yeah. not a problem. You can see the ammo, it's mm -hmm. convenient. You get into mud and dirt and explosions and stuff gets into that magazine very quickly and renders it Toast. It's interesting seeing the modern warfare going on in Ukraine right now with mm -hmm. their trench fighting and how muddy things are getting with all the modern equipment right. and the hellish circumstances that surround that. Now take that and you're working with antiquated guns and antiquated technology compared to us. It really does put into perspective like, hey, this is going to suck. Yeah. <laughs> this you is really going to suck. World War One looked like. There's a lot of resources, but you look at a place like Bakhmut right now. Mm -hmm. It's not that far off from what you would be encountering in much of World War One. And I would hate to take a Shoshan to Bakhmut. Uh, yeah. I I guess I'd just hate to be in Bakhmut. I'd hate to take a show shine to combat anywhere. That's a great point. Uh, it's the best submachine gun except for every other one. It is impressive to see what was asked of the young men of that era and the tools they had. Absolutely. It really is like a daunting task and maybe they were like, ah, cool. I was on a farm, you know, a month ago. Now I got a show shot. This is pretty sick. Maybe it looks better if you don't have anything to compare it to. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. They didn't have to worry about playing video games. They didn't know. They didn't know what's up. If you look at the, the historical record from World War One, there are mixed reports on the show shot. Mm. There are some Americans who absolutely loved it. Like, man, I killed so many huns with this thing, it was great. There is something to be said about a, a certain time period where you have nothing else going on minus getting really good at your craft. And if that's all the time in the world you have and that's what your life depends on and you can just get really good with a hunk of metal like this, maybe you're gonna be pretty biased towards it. You're gonna be like, listen, I got really good with this. What else did I have to do in the trenches besides not die and get good with my show shot? Right. You know what I mean? So there is something to be said about that. That is something to take into account that often get overlooked with these older guns because when people play video games, and I get again, I know the nerdy reference, you're getting to run around with these guns and you have like no fatigue, right? You're not getting tired. You have just about unlimited ammo. You're wielding a gun that is very heavy and cumbersome like it's a modern assault rifle. They do this to make the game playable, but the reality is it's like, that's not how real life is. We're gonna do a ballistic test. You know, in full auto, it's, it's actually pretty terrible. In semi-auto, it's also terrible. It's not as bad as the real life version. The real life version was just atrocious. It's crazy. There's reality to the fatigue of shooting. Yes. And that's something that you see referenced in a lot of the trials when countries go from bolt action to semi-automatic rifles. They notice mm -hmm. like, wow, there's a lot less shooter fatigue running this semi-auto. And it's something that isn't replicated in any sort of, it can't be replicated really in any digital sense. No. Um, but that is an area where the Shosha has a very real advantage because mm -hmm. this is so much easier to carry around and to move with yeah. than any of the other guns. Not just the German light Maxim, but the Lewis gun. Yeah. This is substantially lighter and handier than a Lewis. I made Ian switch sides so you don't think I am crazy tall and that he is crazy short. For whatever reason, we decided the talking head in a little divot. The show goes on. So one thing that I guess we should really mention is how well the gun ran and how many myths that would dispel from kind of gun culture. Yeah, the classic assumption is these things are absolutely jam mm -hmm. you, know, you can't run a mag through them. We put 200, maybe 250 rounds through it today. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you tell me, how many mouths did we have? There were zero malfunctions. I saw zero malfunctions. Um, granted, we weren't in the trenches, there was no mud, and everything is nice and dry. But when these guns are in good shape, mm -hmm. they work. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of the bad press for them comes from mud, trenches, open magazine kind of obvious things. In the US collector's market, I think a lot of the bad press comes from the fact that most of these that came back to the US were deactivated. The mm -hmm. chambers were welded up, the barrels were welded in place, and they were then reactivated by guys who had a wide range of knowing what the hell they were doing. And if you badly reactivate any machine gun, it's going to have a lot of reliability issues. You you couple say. that with disposable magazines that are very easily bent up, and it's not gonna run for crap. Now, what years do you think those were getting reactivated when they're coming here? 60s, and 70s. 60s, 70s. And even still today. So uh, that has like a good, to me, well, I'm just thinking like the FUD lore, how that has good FUD lore potential to, 
you know, to like, all right, it gets cemented into FUD lore around the boomers. Absolutely. And then those, like the Gen Xers are like, okay, now yeah, this is actually a real terrible cut, okay. Yeah. You have plenty of fantastic videos on the show shop. I wasn't planning to go super in depth at all the parts and the details and the functionality. I was just figuring, you know what? If you guys ever find yourself, and I don't know how, picking up a show shop and wanna know how to run it, uh, for safety's sake, what we'll do, we'll go over the manual of arms real quick. So. Manual of arms is gonna be an open bolt weapon system, so lock the bolt to the rear, and when you have rounds in the magazine, she's pretty much now ready to fire if the gun is off safe. So Ian is a better speaker of French than I, so here's our safety selector. So we have safe all the way over to the left. We have M for, what was that, Ian? Mechanique, mechanical, automatic fire. You think you're smarter than me because you know French? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, you are. All right, then we have C, what does that stand for? Coupe à coupe, uh, shot by shot, semi-automatic. Coupe à coupe. Coupa coup. Say that five times fast if you're at home. Coupa coup. All right, now, of course, we have arguably one of the worst parts about the gun, the trigger. The trigger is, let me pop the mag out. Spoiler, that's the mag release right down here. Is this bad boy? We jumped the gun. So you have your mag release right here. Now, when Ian first handed me the gun, I thought this was your bipod holder. Turns out it's not. I'm an idiot. So here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna pull this trigger, and you're gonna see just how terrible of a pull this is. So it's a very heavy trigger. And while we were talking about shooting it in semi-automatic, the semi-automatic functionality of an open bolt weapon system with a heavy trigger is not gonna be an accurate, enjoyable experience, but is going to be a faster experience than running a bolt. Yeah. So that is, that is a pro. And it fires slow enough that it's very easy to run it semi-auto in the full auto position. Yeah. Now, what was the manual of arms for retaining the bipod? Was it just kind of like tuck it up in here and you just, yeah. Or okay. just let it hang. Yeah. I guess if you I want know to hit the deck. It sounds bad to us today to have the weight swinging around out there. Right, but I mean, if you're like, this, this is a quantity gun, that makes sense, I guess. And then to insert the mag, you have a little lip back here, and it's a rock in, so you take this bad boy, rock her in, and she's going to clip into place. Not mag into place, clip into place, right? So, very- The mag clips into place. The mag clips into place. Obviously. The clip mags into place. Who said that? Hello. It's for you. Is it? Yeah. I'm sorry I'm not talking this up as much as you'd like, France. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. For what We're going to be honest with it. You know, Ian, despite the gun's um, reputation, it performed very well. I enjoyed running it because it's hard to have a, a complaint when you're out in, you know, God's green, hot Arizona desert, running and gunning in this part of your job. So it's I'm not mad about like, that. Oh, I had to go shoot an unusual, interesting new machine gun today. Yes, yes. It is a very fun experience. It's a, uh, what I would always call a window into history. A very fun window, I would say. But I think there's history. a lot to be said for recognizing, like, this is what the American army mm -hmm. fought at what was at the time the greatest war in history, yeah. largely with. It's sexy in a steampunk kind of way. It's ugly in a French kind of way. I appreciate you let me borrow. I appreciate you taking the time to film with me today. I say we get out of here and uh, boot scoot and boogie. Sounds like a plan to me. All right, well, let's go. Run away. My gun on a shoe. One, two, buckle my shoe, propped up the show shot on the Solomon shoe. Fun fact, the barrel is essentially identical to a LaBelle rifle barrel. That is a fun fact. Again, industrial, uh, economy of industrial production, you take a LaBelle rifle barrel and you just cut it a little short and mm. you have a show shot barrel. That's, that is pretty cool. Yeah. That is a fun little detail. Now, 